Hello, and thank you for joining this Onc Live TV Peer Exchange. This expert panel discussion will focus on the treatment of patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, particularly the effective sequencing of treatment options. My name is Matthew Kolke, and I'm the director of the program in neuroendocrine and carcinoid tumors at Dana-Farber Brigham and Women's Cancer Center and an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Diane Reedy, who is an assistant attending physician at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, Dr. Rodney Pommier, who is professor of surgery and a surgical oncologist at Oregon Health and Science University, and Jonathan Strasberg, an associate member of the Department of GI Oncology and chair of GI Oncology Research, section head of the Neuroendocrine Oncology Unit at Moffitt Cancer Center. Thank you again for joining us, and let's get started. In our first segment, uh, we'll talk about treatment advances and unmet challenges for pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And I thought we would begin just as a, have a general overview for practicing clinicians about some general questions uh, in identifying and treating patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So let me start with Dr. Palmier. How do you uh, identify patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? How do they come into your practice? Well, sadly, 60 to 80 percent of patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors present with metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. And usually the obvious target uh, is the liver, uh, that we get a scan that shows uh, usually numerous metastases throughout the liver, and that will get biopsied. And unfortunately, pathologists can't really tell one neuroendocrine tumor from another. They all look identical under the microscope. So while sometimes I see a pathology report that says consistent with pancreatic primary or consistent with GI primary carcinoid, the pathologists are never wrong, but they're only occasionally correct. So we actually have to go searching for the primary. And, and it's now, I think it's really critically important that we do that very, very thoroughly because not too long ago, we probably treated all neuroendocrine tumors quite similarly. But as will be the focus of this discussion, there's a huge difference now between the treatment options that we have for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and those for the other carcinoids. So fortunately, most of the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are, are visible on CT scans, and um, we can see them. If not, I'll go straight to an endoscopic ultrasonography, and that will find it. And for those patients that still have occult tumors, um, I will often do an exploratory laparoscopy to rule out the presence of, say, a small bowel carcinoid and actually do an interoperative ultrasonography on the pancreas to find the primary tumor and prove that it's pancreatic. So in your experience, and this is a point that not everyone uh, might appreciate, when we think of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, you, you usually think of these really bizarre hormone symptoms like insulinoma or glucagonoma. Uh, but in fact, you're saying many of these are non-functional, non if you will. Over half of them are non-functional. We do have the four classic syndromes of gastronoma, insulinoma, glucagonoma, and vipoma. Um, the gastronomas and insulinomas frequently are not metastatic. They are such powerful hormone-producing tumors that we can, uh, we can find them when they are still a small, uh, confined neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, the glucagonomas and vipomas, on the other hand, are frequently metastatic. And uh, yeah, the majority of patients I see do not have one of the four classic syndromes, but uh, are more likely to have a non-functional metastatic tumor. I think the other point you made is also critical, that we used to think of neuroendocrine tumors all as one big group, uh, but increasingly we're realizing that the treatments can differ between carcinoid and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, so we want to identify or be sure that someone either does or does not have a primary pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. You described a fairly aggressive approach to trying to look for that. Uh, let me ask my other panel members, maybe starting with, with John, how aggressive are you in, in looking for a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor if you don't really know where the primary is? Well, <clears throat> it's important, I think, to start with several imaging modalities. So the obvious ones are CT and MRI. Beyond that, there's Octrea scan, somatostatin receptor scintigraphy. Uh, endoscopic ultrasound, I think, is quite reasonable if you're still suspecting a primary pancreatic tumor but uh, can't prove it on other imaging modalities. EUS can detect tumors as small as half a centimeter in size. So I feel it's unusual to have to resort to surgical exploration to rule out a pancreatic primary, but uh, we do that in some cases, for example, to rule out a small intestinal primary. And Diane, how about at your center? What's your protocol usually for looking for whether they have a pancreatic primary or something else? Absolutely. So we, we often start, like uh, John and Rad explained, with good quality cross-sectional imaging, making sure that you do have pancreatic cuts um, or MRI. 
Um, most times you can identify the primary there. It's tricky sometimes because it is true that many times small bowel primaries are very difficult to find, but I think you can try to personalize it. So for example, patients that have mesenteric lymph nodes, that's often consistent with a small bowel primary, although not definitive. Um, so we usually do a good quality cross-sectional imaging. Um, you obviously talk to the patient. So if they have signs and symptoms consistent with a carcinoid syndrome like flushing or diarrhea, um, that would typically be more um, likely consistent with a small bowel primary as opposed to a pancreatic. Certainly if they had functional symptoms suggestive of the four syndromes that Rod had explained, then, then I would search a little bit more carefully. Um, I think at that point when my suspicion is very high because they're secreting hormones that I think are consistent with pancreatic primary or they may have peripancreatic lymph nodes, at that point I think I would err on the side of going to an endoscopic ultrasound. But my practice, I'm not routinely doing endoscopic ultrasounds to look for that primary.